I hope you've been having a great conference so far. Uh, I'm going to be presenting on Jaeger. I'm going to do a quick project intro and recap on what Jaeger is and what tracing is. And uh, a co-maintainer, Joe, is going to go for deeper dive into how one might deploy Jaeger using the operator. So what is Jaeger? Jaeger is a open source distributed tracing platform. It's among the most popular ones. Uh, Jaeger graduated from CNCF and it was started at Uber around 2015 or so. It was shortly, it was open sourced in a couple of years later or thereabouts. Who am I? Um, I'm Prit Viraj. I'm a Jaeger maintainer. I've been uh, working with Jaeger since uh, 2015 or so. And I continue to work with Jaeger at Uber. Uh, sadly, most of the work I do these days is uh, specific to Uber, so I'm unable to contribute to open source. So I'm going to start by uh, talking about observability in distributed systems and microservices. Now let's transition to this graph. Now, the graph we see here uh, represents a subset of Uber's architecture. Uh, the dots or points are nodes and uh, or services, and the edges represent a call between a service to a different service. Now, Uber's uh, microservice architecture is pretty large. It has about 4,000 microservices, and uh, requests uh, routinely touch several hundreds of microservices. So when someone requests a ride, or someone is looking up for receipt or something, it might involve a large amount of services being uh, touched or being uh, requested data off. And this happens very frequently. So this happens billions of times a day. So in a complicated system like this, uh, tracing really shows its value. Um, we are transitioning into a trace timeline view. This is a request from Hot Rod, which is a Jaeger demo that you may download from uh, jaegertracing.io. And we're going to use this to describe parts of the UI. Um, so on this, on the left, we have the service name, and then we have the operation name in gray. And on the right, we have this rectangle, which represents uh, the time taken for this operation. Uh, this is called a span. In uh, tracing terms, this is the smallest uh, unit of operation that you can represent. It's a small logical unit. On the top um, or here, we have a Gantt chart. And this allows users to like um, focus and zoom into particular regions of the trace. On the top, we also get this nice trace summary that tells us how many services were involved, what is the depth, and how many spans there are in this particular trace. Another way of visualizing this trace, um, or a different trace to say, is by using the single trace service dependencies view. In this particular view, we see that um, a particular service calls a bunch of other services, which call a bunch of other services, so on and so forth. Like um, this view allows one to orient themselves within a trace. And uh, this is really useful um, when the architecture is both wide and deep. In this particular case, we see that um, the depth is 16. So the 16 services deep and the 32 services involved in total. So in this sort of situation, it may be useful to find out like what's going on or how these services interact with each other. One of the interesting things with the microservice architecture is uh, the notion of like things going wrong and the notion of detecting how things go wrong. For anyone who's worked with microservices, you know that like finding um, where something is going wrong is really, really difficult. Like um, things might be broken in a particular service only for some requests, or we might not even be able to detect it using traditional tools like um, logs and metrics. Some categories of things that are undetectable by logs and metrics are things like um, a service waiting on its dependent service to respond, or service making a larger number of calls to dependent services than is required, etc. Um, once something is known to be broken, 
uh, we may dig into it deeper using uh, tools like logs and profiles, etc., um, to determine how best to fix it. And a lot of times, once uh, we detect which service or service instance is having an issue, it may not be as difficult to then fix that issue. We're going to transition into a high level of how uh, tracing works. Now, tracing depends on context propagation. Now, how context propagation works is when a request comes in um, through an edge service, and this might be an API gateway or some such, uh, it is stamped with a unique ID, a trace ID. And uh, this trace ID might contain additional fields, and this is called a context. Uh, this context is then propagated to every service in the call chain uh, by using headers or any other similar mechanism. The main thing this context allows tracing systems to do is to assign causality. So in this particular case, the tracing system Jaeger uh, would be able to deduce that uh, B was called by A and by nothing else. On the right side of this, we have a Gantt chart view. This is representing the same data that is uh, on the left of the screen, but uh, I hear there's a time dimension. So there's a latency and a start time that's added to these uh, spans. Uh, spans might also contain any additional information. So they might contain um, logs, they might contain um, key value pairs known as tags, and you're just limited by your imagination on what you can put in here. So next we move on to sampling. Jaeger data is very rich. So as we saw in this particular slide, we have for every RPC, um, there are spans being generated, and this is a large volume of data. So to control the volume of data, um, Jaeger performs sampling by default. So what is sampling? Sampling is just uh, a notion of saying, only some percentage or some population of traces are going to collect data and will be stored. Now, there are, multi there are several different ways of doing sampling, but the most common and easiest one to do is head-based sampling, where every request has a sampling decision that is made, and this sampling decision is propagated. So once something is decided to be uh, not sampled, uh, no additional data would be collected. We're going to move into uh, Jaeger architecture. Now on Jaeger architecture, how it works is that there are a bunch of client libraries. Um, these are SDKs uh, which are available in multiple different languages. So Jaeger conforms to the open tracing standard and um, it supports um, instrumentation in Go, Java, Python, a bunch of other services. Um, so essentially these client libraries generate spans um, and these spans go to the trace collection backend. And the visualization frontend uh, retrieves these spans from the trace collection backend and uh, visualizes them as traces. This includes the Gantt chart view, the dependency view, etc. Uh, optionally, it, Jaeger may be deployed with a data mining platform, which can uh, generate dependency graphs of uh, services. Now, what is interesting about this architecture? Um, is that it can be deployed in multiple different ways. Um, this is uh, with varying trade-offs, and this is something uh, Joe is going to talk about shortly. One of the things that I'd like to highlight is this left portion of this architecture. Specifically, when we look at this, um, we see this remote sampling. Um, remote sampling allows Jaeger Collector to control the sampling rate and this sampling rate is read by Jaeger clients. And this really allows uh, Jaeger clients um, to, sorry, this really allows Jaeger Collector to control the amount of traffic that Jaeger clients and these applications um, send to it. Um, so for instance, if you have a sampling rate of 100%, it means that Jaeger client on every service is going to send 100% of spans to Jaeger Collector. Vice versa, like if you have something like zero or something like one in thousand, like you, uh, the traffic that is being sent to Jaeger Collector is really reduced. So this remote sampling is a really important uh, configuration that you should know that allows um, you to control 
the amount of traffic that is being handled by the remainder of your system. Uh, now I'm going to transition to Joe, who's going to talk a lot more about um, the Kubernetes operator and how to deploy again, what trade-offs they are. Thank you. Hey everyone, my name is Joe, and um, today we're going to talk about the Jaeger operator. Uh, quick quick uh, information about me, I'm a Jaeger maintainer who works at Grafana Labs, primarily on our distributed tracing infrastructure, uh, and I enjoy riding my bike quite a bit. Um, that's a picture from my local park, I ride past that fountain multiple times a week. Um, and I, my Twitter handle's in the bottom, you're welcome to give me a follow, I mainly just tweet about uh, distributed tracing uh, uh, stuff. So Jaeger itself, a uh, quick primer, we all know what that is I hope. Uh, it's a distributed tracing backend that allows us to do this, which is visualize a request as it passes through our uh, infrastructure, as it passes through you know, all of the many services that are used to um, answer requests, can often be difficult to understand you know, where it was spending time. Distributed tracing kind of gives us those answers, shows us all of the different pieces and where uh, the time was spent, as well as of course we can attach additional metadata. The operator itself builds the cluster that we can then use to go kind of use that, see that UI, right? The Jaeger UI, um, record the data, uh, store it, and then visualize it. Um, it operates Jaeger on Kubernetes, which is an extremely uh, useful sentence. <laughs> it's primarily maintained by JP Crawling, who's a Red Hat engineer um, and a long-term Jaeger maintainer. And there's two important links here. If you get involved with the operator, the GitHub repo itself, as well as the docs, which are fantastic. And I spent quite a bit of time in when I was preparing this presentation. So let's talk about what we're doing today. We're going to talk about, you know, how to use the, the operator to make a cluster, to configure our storage, as well as some other configuration options we're going to look at. We're going to talk about how to deploy the agent and the strategies available, and remote sampling, which is an awesome feature of Jaeger, uh, as well as auto scaling, more and, uh, and more, quite a bit more. In fact, this presentation. Um, is not capable of covering all of the you know features of the operator, but we'll try to touch on at least you know what it can do for you kind of at the end that we we don't cover. Uh, what we're not going to cover in this presentation is you know kind of in depth what Jaeger is or what tracing is or uh, what operators are or Kubernetes is. Um, so we kind of had this expectation, hopefully that you know you are uh, you understand these pieces, you know what Jaeger is, and maybe you're considering the operator as an option for deployment. So to get started, um, first I'd recommend going to check out the docs. Uh, the link was you know, in there before, here's the second link. Uh, and it's gonna tell you to do a bunch of kubectl create Fs. Uh, so there's a whole lot of YAML, kind of canned YAML that creates you know, deployments and services, um, service accounts, uh, roles, uh, role bindings, uh, all, all kinds of pieces, right, that you're gonna need to deploy the, uh, that you're gonna need to deploy the operator itself. Um, a second piece of early advice I'd give is to check the logs. Uh, the logs were excellent. I, if I was running into an issue, if I had um, didn't understand why the operator was doing something, uh, the logs are often very clear about exactly what it was choosing to do and why it was choosing to do it. Um, so if you are having issues digging the logs very quickly, um, I thought they were quite good. Um, a very early configuration point that we need to talk about before we move forward is this watch namespace environment variable. Uh, so in the bottom left, you can see uh, what comes in the canned YAML. The, by default, it's going to use the <laughs> Kubernetes downward API to um, choose the namespace that you deploy the operator to. And it's only going to watch that namespace to build new clusters or to deploy the uh, agent sidecars. Um, other options are empty. So if you set watch namespace to empty, it's going to actually watch all Kubernetes, all, um, all of the namespaces in your cluster. In fact, for you know just getting started, playing with the operator, this might be the best one to choose because it will very quickly, um, because it will very quickly help you, you know, It'll kind of remove this configuration option. It'll watch all namespaces and you can move quickly and just kind of immediately get to understanding the operator and what it does, and then maybe come back and narrow this down later. Um, and then a final option is to actually specify a very specific namespace, only watch this namespace, and that works as well. So to make a cluster, we're gonna use a CRD. Um, and this is a really clever, frankly, Kubernetes feature where you can define a custom resource and then you can treat it as a first class resource, just like all of the other pieces of Kubernetes you're used to. You can use kubectl to edit them or uh, create them. Um, you can view them in all the same ways. You can query them through the API in all the same ways. It's really fantastic, honestly. Um, but uh, in this case, we're going to make a object of type or kind Jaeger. 
uh, the operator is going to pick that up and it's going to go make the actual resources necessary to uh, it's going to go make the resources necessary to create the actual cluster. Um, so we're going to make a just very simple object like you would make a deployment. And then this operator piece um, is going to go make the actual pods and all of the different infrastructure necessary to have the, the object we, we uh, specified. Um, in this case, uh, we have this strategy option. It's kind of a first choice here when you're making a cluster. And by default, it uses all-in-one, which is a great place to start. All-in-one is a single binary deployment. But we can also choose production or streaming. So if you're getting started playing with the operator, use all-in-one and kind of just get a feel for it. Deploy a test application, see all the traces in your back end, and then kind of move up the chain. And you can try some of these other deployment options as well. Um, all-in-one deploys a single binary. The single binary, um, by default, I have backend database kind of over here. Um, but by default, it actually stores all of your traces in memory. So if you roll the pod, your traces disappear. Um, but you can deploy an optional backend database. So your application through the client is going to talk to the agent. The agent pushes traces to the, or the spans to the single binary, which it stores then in memory. Uh, for the production and streaming options, um, you have, uh, you know, this uh, stretch, or you have a uh, a set of services that are deployed uh, by the um, by the operator that you can kind of scale independently, which helps you um, have more control over, I guess, the uh, more control over the over, over the uh, over the Jaeger cluster. So here we have the client talking to the agent. Agent talks to collector, and if we're using the streaming option, we also have Kafka and a Jaeger ingester, and then finally to the backend database. So if you choose production, this green box is not deployed. If you choose uh, streaming, the green box is part of the uh, deployment. Um, Kafka and the backend database are kind of our external infrastructure pieces. And we'll talk about those in a second. Oh, and then the Jaeger query also is deployed, which talks directly to the backend database. So storage configuration is done through this exact same object we looked at. We looked at the CRD. We saw we specified the type, right, um, which was uh, uh, production or streaming or all-in-one, and here we're going to specify the storage. So here's where we would specify we want to use Elasticsearch. Uh, Cassandra is also an option. Um, Elasticsearch is the current recommended option for a Jaeger backend. But we specify Elasticsearch, and then we have to specify our um, we have to specify where our Elasticsearch cluster is, basically. So that makes sense. Um, and then if we want to use Kafka, so we have the streaming option, the, str the streaming strategy, then we have to specify, uh, you know, for our ingester side, if you recall this, this doc, or if you recall the diagram, it's collector, goes to the Kafka, or goes to Kafka, goes to an ingester, goes to your backend. So for the ingester, we have to say, you know, you're a Kafka consumer, here's where Kafka ex exists. For a collector, we have to say, you're a Kafka producer, here is where Kafka exists. So, um, for the configuration, we basically have to, on both sides, tell the ingester and the collector where to find our Kafka uh, uh, queue. And this is kind of a neat feature. So if you ever run you know, one of the pieces, if, if I ever want to know how to configure Jaeger, I often do this, Docker run, and I specify the pod, in this case, the collector, and I say dash dash help. Um, or not the pod, but the service. I say help. And I can immediately get like a dump of every single option that I can provide to the collector, which helps me understand what the configuration options are, what my kind of tunables are. Um, all of these are available through the, um, through the operator by using this pattern you see below. So this is really useful if you're moving from an existing deployment and you already have a lot of these configured, or if you just know you want some of these. For instance, queue size is common to change if you want a larger queue size or you want more workers working on your queue or whatever. Um, you're going to want to change those options, and you can do that very cleanly through um, spec. So this, again, is our Jaeger CRD, our Jaeger object, spec, collector, options. And now everything below options is going to be mapped um, directly to a CLI parameter. So collector queue size will be mapped to collector dot queue size. And this, um, this configuration will set the queue size to 100. So all of the configuration options you can find, both in the docs or through running dash dash help, are going to be um, available through the operator by using this options pattern. In fact, if you pass in garbage options, so options blurg blurg 10, then it's just going to pass that exact parameter. You can see it's saying unknown flag blurg dot blurg. Um, <clears throat> and so this is just kind of this future proof pattern that uh, I believe JP came up with that lets you specify any parameter you want. So all of those options are available and open to you um, to use uh, on your Jaeger cluster. 
The agent strategy is another very important piece of choosing, uh, or an important choice when you're deploying your Jaeger um, cluster. And by default, we're going to, by default, the operator is going to set up what's called a sidecar. So by default, when an a pod is deployed, if it's in a watch namespace, um, as well as um, we're looking, the, as well as we have this metadata annotation, um, the Jaeger operator is going to inject a agent sidecar next to your pod. So, you know, a pod is a collection of containers. Um, our pod might contain or will, will contain our application and it might contain a couple sidecars, which maybe do things like debugging or do some kind of like metrics offloading. In this case, it's going to be a sidecar that is the actual Jaeger agent, um, which is going to consume the spans and then push them onto our collector. Um, this is the default strategy, and it's a very powerful strategy, and it works fine up to quite large um, deployment sizes. Um, the one thing you need to be aware of is either your deployment needs this annotation. This annotation tells um, the sidecar.jaegertracing.io slash inject true tells the operator that I do want the, uh, the agent sidecar on the pods from this deployment. You can also put this on the namespace, and then all pods deployed to that namespace will, um, will have the sidecar injected. So kind of both are an option. A second, uh, more complicated option that I'd recommend only experimenting with kind of is if you need to, would be a daemon set option. So in the daemon set, um, we have one agent per node, and all of the applications on that node can be configured to send spans to the node. Now, it's kind of complicated because there's no direct way to reference the daemon set that is on the daemon set pod that's on your node. So you actually have to um, have the agent open a node port. Um, then you have the applications report. Uh, you, then you have the applications send their spans to the node port of the host they're on, um, and uh, at the same port or at the Jaeger agent port. So it's complicated. Um, I would only recommend it if you need to. I'm not really sure what the threshold is. Hundreds, thousands of pods per node. Maybe make this starts to make sense. I can't say for sure. But in this mode, um, we're going to deploy one agent per node. All of the applications on that are gonna, node are going to report to it. And then we are going to send those onto the collector. And you can see here um, in the Jaeger uh, CRD, in that object we keep talking about, it's the same object this whole time. We're just kind of configuring different elements. Um, in this case, we're going to say agent strategy is daemon set. Like I said, by default, it is that sidecar strategy. Um, remote sampling is another cool feature that um, uh, I have always loved in Kubernetes, I'm sorry, in Jaeger. Now, remote sampling allows you to uh, remotely control the sample, uh, the sampling rates uh, per operation of all of your applications. Um, they have to be configured to go find the remote sampling file to bring it in and to configure themselves. But uh, this does give you, as an operator, um, it gives you central control over the rates at which you sample all of your different applications and their different endpoints. Um, which, if an endpoint were to change and suddenly create, you know, 10 times the spans it normally creates, it's overwhelming your backend, this would be your way to slow it down, basically. Um, normally, you have to kind of create this JSON file and send the JSON file to the uh, collector. Um, this, the operator simplifies that quite a bit by just, again, in this Jaeger CRD, in this Jaeger object, we're going to have the sampling options, and we can then immediately specify our... Um, our remote sampling strategy. And then again, we can have us per service, we can have per operation even, and that really gives a lot of central control to um, handle the tracing load that we've brought into our backend. Um, auto scaling, also important. Uh, we have this kind of collectors and ingesters layer, right? So agents are either sidecar or daemon set, reports to a set of collectors, which then maybe go to Kafka if you use streaming or maybe not, um, and then a set of ingesters, which are also um, uh, this, a stateless piece of the Jaeger pipeline. Um, so these collectors and ingesters can scale if you're, um, if you're uh, load goes up considerably, you might need more collectors to effectively move them through uh, the queue in the collector and put them in Kafka. Same with the ingesters. If your load goes up significantly and you have a back, your spans are backing up in Kafka, you can use auto scaling to bring up your ingesters. Um, by default, it's going to create a horizontal pod auto scaler with a max of 100, which is quite a large uh, installation. Um, and you might find it, uh, you might find that you want to adjust that. So you can say spec again in this Jaeger object, collector max replicas. I can control the max. Again, max is default is 100. Or if you just want to turn this off, if you don't want to bother with auto scaling, you can also set auto scale to false and then set 
I just want 10 replicas always, or maybe a set number. Um, both options are kind of up to you as an operator. Uh, kind of choose the one that makes sense to you and what kind of meets your needs, I guess, in your Jaeger cluster. Uh, this was a piece of the Jaeger operator that I thought was quite cool and didn't under didn't know all of these features exist when I first started out. Um, but there's a number of different other operator integrations. So for storage, we were saying you need to go make a Kafka uh, queue or Elasticsearch backend, and then you need to configure your um, application. You need to configure your cluster to see them, to go point at them. Um, if you have the Kafka or Elasticsearch operator installed, uh, the Jaeger operator will recognize that and it will do it by noticing that the CRDs are defined and it will make a Kafka or it will make an Elasticsearch cluster for you. Um, so if you have the Kafka and Elasticsearch operators and the Jaeger operator, then you don't have to provision this backend. Um, the Jaeger operator will do it for you through the other operators. Um, and then finally, if you have the Prometheus operator, it will create the appropriate service monitor objects to monitor your Jaeger cluster. So these operator integrations were quite interesting. Um, I didn't realize these existed, existed when I first started out, uh, but it would simplify quite a bit of configuration, of building a backend, um, and kind of let you immediately, very quickly, spin up a set of operated um, the Jaeger, your Jaeger cluster, your backend, and um, your service monitors very quickly. Um, there's quite a bit more. Um, in fact, before I started this project, I've never used an operator to run something in a production environment. I've run a number of operators locally to learn about them, to kind of play with them. And um, this Jaeger operator is one of the first that I really enjoyed and felt like it was giving me value back by spending a lot of time with it. Even if you don't want to deploy with an operator, I would recommend using at least the Jaeger operator for a while because it will teach you how to operate Jaeger. It'll teach you all the pieces. It'll sh when you look at all the configuration options, um, you will walk away with a much better understanding of Jaeger. Um, so other things it can do are like Cassandra schema creation. It can work with Elasticsearch to do handle your indexes. It will run the Spark dependency job um, so you can get a nice dependency graph in the Jaeger UI. It'll handle version upgrades of Jaeger. It supports OpenShift and then it has fine grained support for all kinds of Kubernetes um, objects. Uh, finally, um, some resources, some online resources, uh, Jaeger tracing IO, uh, the docs, the Jaeger docs are always great. Please go check them out if you're getting into Jaeger. Uh, at the CNCF Slack, check out the Jaeger channel. Um, a lot of us inhabit the Jaeger channel and do our best to help people who are having issues. And then uh, on Medium uh, slash Jaeger Tracing, you can find a lot, a lot of blog posts, which are going to give you a lot of you know in-depth information, other detailed information about Jaeger. Um, please reach out and connect. Please get involved. Um, and hopefully we'll see you in one of these channels. Hopefully we'll see uh, you getting involved and we can you know chat with you through some of these other uh, channels. And, uh, take care everyone and I hope you have a great conference and I will see you when I see you.